All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Codex uh, speaker event. Uh, I'm uh, Roland Vogel, Executive Director of Codex. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce our uh, speaker to you all. Um, we have uh, with us uh, Professor Michelle Mello, who holds a joint appointment uh, at um, uh, Stanford uh, School of Medicine, as well as uh, uh, the law school. Uh, she is uh, one of the uh, leading uh, empirical health law scholars. Uh, she's uh, in her research focusing on understanding the effects uh, of law and regulation on, on, on the delivery of healthcare and uh, population outcomes. She's a prolific author with uh, more than 200 articles that have appeared in the leading journals on, on medical liability, public health, pharmaceuticals, and vaccines, uh, biomedical research, ethics, and governance, and uh, health information uh, privacy, among, uh, among um, many topics that she's covering. Uh, she is, her work's been published in, in, uh, in medical and health policy journals. She is a frequent contributor uh, to the New England Journal of Medicine. And she's here with us today to, to talk about uh, ethics and governance for digital disease uh, surveillance. So uh, with that uh, brief introduction, I will turn it over to Michelle. Great. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to everybody who's joined us for finding the time for one more Zoom. Just when you think there isn't any, there's always one more Zoom. Uh, I'll try to keep my remarks to um, around a half hour to leave plenty of time for discussion. Um, and I, what I wanted to cover was um, some of the current thinking around uses of technology in fighting COVID-19 and more broadly in other pandemics, with a focus on a particular technology that's gotten a lot of attention in the US and Europe, which is digital contact tracing. Uh, some of you might have an iPhone that looks like mine. When you go into the settings, you see uh, that there you have chosen to install a little app called Exposure Notification. When you open that up, it indicates that your phone is collecting information about where you travel. And in my case, that I've chosen to opt into the possibility of sharing that information with the California Department of Public Health. This is a, a so-called exposure notification system. It's a variety of digital contact tracing systems. And I think all of us um, got an opportunity uh, to opt into this system if we carry an Apple phone a few months ago. Um, so this is the type of technology that I'm going to focus on today. I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons. Um, but before we get to that, I want to talk more generally about the field of digital epidemiology and, and what it all means. This is a topic that I explored um, last year in an article in Science Magazine with my colleague at the medical school, Jason Wang. Jason is a, a pediatrician by training and a PhD in health policy, and he has, among other things, worked extensively with the government of Taiwan, his home country, um, in implementing novel technologies for control of COVID-19. Before I go very much farther, I do want to make one conflict of interest disclosure, which is that I work with Verily, um, which is the life sciences arm of Google on an app. It is a, not a digital contact tracing app. It's an app um, called Healthy at Work that's designed to return people safely to the workplace. Uh, so I do want to make that disclosure. Um, I'll have uh, many uh, negative things to say about uh, tech companies, um, but I am also aware of how hard they're working to try to contribute to the fight that we, we all have felt called to contribute to. So what is, what is digital epidemiology? Um, this is the use of novel data sources that are generated outside of the healthcare system and the public health system for purposes of disease surveillance. And we've been doing this for more than a quarter of a century around the world in different forms. Um, some of the earliest manifestations of digital epidemiology consisted of looking at internet news media reports to try to detect where outbreaks were happening or might be happening around the world and what they had in common. Um, later, there was, were uses of web scrapers to look at people's social media posts and their internet search history, for example, looking at particular respiratory systems, again, to find early warning systems about where diseases were popping out around the globe. Um, more recently, use has been made of cell phone data, as I've already alluded to. Um, first, just looking at how people travel among cell phone towers, and then more recently, 
using low energy Bluetooth technology to get a more granular sense of where people are traveling and who they're coming into contact with. And other data sources come directly from users on a more intentional basis. Users can opt into so-called participatory surveillance systems where they agree to be part of a group of people who are tracking their symptoms, for example, in an area that might be affected by an infectious disease. Um, and many of us currently participate in these surveillance systems, whether you think of them as voluntary or not, because if you want to come on campus, now you have to complete health screen and I have to do that every morning for my children to attend school. Finally, digital epidemiology has long made use of massive sources of personal data, again, from outside the healthcare system, things like birth and death certificates, um, uh, hospital discharge data, all this stuff can be mined uh, on often on a de-identified basis to discover patterns of disease. And the goal of all of this is to figure out where disease is happening, how it's traveling through the population, and ultimately what's effective in staunching it. So as I said, this stuff has been going on now um, for the better part of um, you know my lifetime, certainly. And the question that I'm interested in is, is what's new during COVID-19? Um, and, and there's a lot that has accelerated and innovated during this pandemic. Uh, one of the most prominent developments is great advances in the nature and sophistication of modeling that is being done around the pandemic. All kinds of new forms of modeling. Um, not just the traditional things we do, which is like, let's put in a bunch of variables into a prediction model to understand how cases are expected to grow or contract over time or which populations we think disease is gonna move into, but um, more granular analyses of, of the flow of human populations across geographic areas, so-called flow modeling, as well as predictive models to identify individual level risk of developing disease. So here is a, a paper that just gives a sense of the type of analyses that can be accomplished using cell phone mobility data. In panel B here, you have a little data set consisting of the number of trips from areas A to B or C to D and so forth to give a sense. For example, we could use this to understand how stay at home orders are affecting people's uh, likelihood of leaving their home and traveling out of their immediate area. And then panel C, we have a, a little data set that shows the number of personal contacts that different users have broken down by age group, uh, which might give us a sense if when we see disparities in, in COVID cases across different age groups, how much of that is due to susceptibility versus number of exposures, for example, or again, might help us understand how young people respond to uh, stay-at-home orders versus, versus older people. So there are just a huge number of things that can be done. And in addition to um, doing new kinds of models, there's all kinds of new modeling techniques that we've seen, including increasing use of artificial intelligence, machine learning models to try to predict individual level risk. Um, and one of the most notorious examples of that was in China, where the government um, asked that citizens of one area install this app called Alipay. Um, on their smartphones. And what it does is assign you a risk code, red, yellow, or green, based on demographic and mobility characteristics. And that risk code in this, in this particular context determined your freedom of movement, whether you were allowed to move around just in your immediate neighborhood or, or go farther. Uh, and it provoked a, a lot of resistance because people got results that did not match their own intuitions about how risky they were to others and because the algorithm was really non-transparent to the local population. Um, so, you know, I think a theme of my talk today will be there's lots to criticize in these particular applications of technology. Um, it's also the case that in, in this example, that was a uh, an attempt to avoid the kind of mass shelter in place orders that we used here in the United States, where we didn't try to really differentiate among individuals on the basis of risk. We impose those burdens on everybody. And so one of the, the great trade offs here is um, balancing these sort of privacy or risk of error considerations against the alternative, which for COVID has meant everybody gets burdened with liberty restrictions. So these new forms of modeling is one thing that's new. There are lots of other new things. I'll just run down a few of, I think, some of the most interesting examples here, and then we'll focus again on the contact tracing app. 
Uh, one is, is really novel data linkages to try to identify cases. Early on in the pandemic, you'll recall, it was really hard to get a test, and, and not just early on, really until quite recently, really hard to get a test, especially if you're asymptomatic. And so um, one thing that was important, it was trying to identify people who should be prioritized for testing. And uh, some of the countries around the world did this in kind of creative ways. For example, in just one day, the Taiwanese government linked data from their immigration and travel systems, their customs data, with data on medical visits uh, to find people who had both traveled to hot zones and presented with respiratory systems. Those people could be prioritized for follow-up, for testing, et cetera. Um, we didn't do any of that in the early days. And so, as you may recall, it was really haphazard as to who was able to get seen and get a test. Enhanced risk-based border security measures is a similar thing we've seen rolled out, particularly in some of the East Asian countries again. Taiwan, for example, instead of just imposing a blanket travel ban, imposed a system where they would look uh, on an individualized basis to see where you were coming from and whether you reported any symptoms and had a fever on your incoming flight. And based on an algorithm, you got assigned to a green, red, or yellow lane at the airport where you could freely pass through or, or have to undergo some additional screening. And again, um, you know, that's an alternative to just a blanket ban on travel to hot zones. Electronic monitoring of individuals who are subject to isolation quarantine orders is another potential use uh, of technology. Again, we saw this mostly in the Eastern Asian countries during the pandemic, but um, you know, in the context in which we've all become used to quarantine, it, uh, we think about this as being like a home-based phenomenon. When we're quarantined, we stay home. That is, that is kind of revolutionary. Historically, during pandemics, when you are quarantined or isolated, you are in a facility and you're directly observed. We haven't done that this time around simply because of the scale of the quarantines that have gone on. But in the ordinary course of things, when you get exposed to a person with infectious disease, you have to go to a facility. But the use of smartphones um, opens up new possibilities for confining people in less restrictive settings, including the home, and checking on them um, by dent of video calls and uh, symptom reporting apps. And this is you know, a, a much less intrusive way of carrying out quarantine and isolation than is ordinarily the case. It also opens up the possibility of, of better supporting people who are in quarantine. Uh, if health workers can easily check on them, they can also, in theory, arrange for support services for people who are confined. And, and that, that increases the chances that they will um, adhere to the conditions of their confinement. On the other hand, we saw some um, pretty controversial uses of surveillance technology for this purpose. Um, perhaps most famously in France, uh, the French used drone flights to enforce movement restrictions to guide enforcement teams on the ground, uh, prompting a successful legal challenge. Uh, they also um, used artificial intelligence technology to try to monitor who among the Paris Metro riders was complying with masking orders. Uh, they also abandoned that effort after a backlash. So some real controversy emerging in this, in this area. Next, we get to digital contact tracing. Uh, as, as I said, we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, the, the sort of context here is that traditionally, when we do contact tracing in public health, it's like shoe leather, shoe leather detective work. When a person is diagnosed with a reportable infectious disease, they are interviewed, they're asked who they've come into contact with, and then a public health worker starts making phone calls and visiting people's homes. And it's usually feasible to do that because the kinds of diseases that we do it for uh, are not diseases that a lot of people have, and they're not, uh, they, they don't spread through the air. So for example, when you come up down with a sexually transmitted infection, it's relatively straightforward to figure out who the contact tracers need to get in touch with for most people. And uh, they don't worry too much about casual contacts. Uh, that's not the case with COVID, obviously. The, the two things about COVID that really stink from a contact tracing perspective um, is that people are asymptomatic for often the entire course of their illness, and that they transmit the disease during um, asymptomatic periods. About 50% of cases are transmitted from asymptomatic individuals. Also problematic is the increasing evidence uh, that this is an aerosolized disease, not fully aerosolized like measles, but it travels through the air in small droplets, as you probably know, and that's why we're all wearing masks right now. And what that means is that it is not, in fact, easy to identify all the people that you have possibly infected and this makes human only contact tracing um, destined to fail for a virus like COVID-19. 
like SARS-CoV-2. So uh, that's why there's been such an interest in augmenting human contact tracing with digital technologies like cell phone Bluetooth technology. And uh, Singapore was one of the earliest pioneers of this way of doing things. It encouraged uh, its citizens to install this app called Trace Together um, that uses this low energy Bluetooth technology essentially to have the phones just exchange identifier numbers with each other constantly. As you move around the world, you're swapping numbers with other phones. Um, any phone that you come into six feet uh, proximity to, whether whether there's a wall between you or not, that the phones don't know, but they will swap these numbers. And then if and only if somebody is diagnosed as COVID positive, then um, something is triggered within the app. Sometimes, depending on the type of app, if it's just a pure exposure notification app, like the one on my phone, you just get a message yourself saying, uh, look, you, you know, uh, you've come into contact with somebody who has tested positive. Um, other forms of DCT contemplate a direct report to public health authorities, which can then put them in the position to intervene either by sending out, for example, in Israel, a text message saying you need to immediately quarantine for 14 days or just have a human contact tracer start making phone calls. So those are the basics of DCT. The last thing I want to mention that's really new in COVID-19 is uh, the role of private industry. Um, as I mentioned, I think we, we've all kind of felt the call to make a contribution to fighting the global pandemics and tech companies are no exception. They have responded with unbelievable vigor by developing just hundreds and hundreds of different apps that can contribute to the fight in different ways. Um, they have been supervised uh, almost not at all. <laughs> there was an early effort by the Trump administration to convene tech leaders to talk about development of these apps. Uh, to my knowledge, it consisted of a single closed door meeting and it didn't really result in any uh, coordinated initiative. So the companies have kind of gone it alone. Um, and uh, so it's been a very uh, devolved, differentiated and unsupervised effort. And that is new. Usually epidemiology is done by the public sector, by local and state public health departments coordinated by the CDC. So this is a reasonable rundown of what has evolved over the last year. The natural question is, uh, what does it all mean? What, what ought we be concerned about, particularly from an ethical perspective? Uh, and so let me run down some issues that have no doubt already occurred to you in the course of hearing about these technologies. So first, of course, is um, it, how, we, how we do this in a way that affords adequate protection to individual privacy. Uh, using cell phone location and text data for epidemiology um, goes beyond what most citizens of democratic nations are accustomed to or have come to think about as a customary use of their data. Um, and, you know, except for use by law enforcement with due process, we don't usually use those kind of data to impose a sanction on an individual to deprive them of something. But countries like Israel have taken that approach. As I mentioned, you get that automatic text and that imposes a quarantine on you that is legally enforceable. So it, it sort of is a shock to the system for those for whom privacy is a pretty important core value. It also raises other concerns uh, like how we adequately respect autonomy. Usually when we talk about medical interventions or research interventions, the concept of informed consent to participation is front and center. And that concept gets abridged a lot when we're fighting infectious disease for reasons you can all understand that some when people are in the domain where they are posing a threat to others, they don't get to have absolute autonomy anymore. Um, but again, these new uh, technologies potentially can be used without the individual user's consent or even awareness, and that really puts questions about informed consent front and center. Third, there are real issues around um, how to minimize the risk of error and how we think about allocating the risk of mistakes on one side or another. Um, one problem with COVID and the development of all these apps is that they took place under enormous time pressure. And that led to some compromises on testing and validation relative to what these companies might ordinarily do before rolling out a product with some um, results that were embarrassing to say the least. And we have to take that seriously, particularly in contexts where um, a result like in the Chinese Alipay example or the Israeli contact tracing example can involve the immediate triggering of a social burden like confinement um, or inability to attend your job. Those have to be taken seriously. And of course, when mistakes occur, 
uh, they really undermine trust in government and in the companies developing these technologies. So a related issue then is, is accountability, how to hold the developers and implementers of these technologies fairly accountable for operating the system in a responsible way, for adhering to the promises they made about how data are going to be used, and for having an exit strategy so that this doesn't become the new normal, that when, when these data are no longer needed, they're no longer collected and used. Um, especially since a lot of the app development was led by countries that lack a strong democratic tradition you know, and are not highly transparent, um, there have been a lot of concerns about the potential for misappropriation of data. After all, the same approaches that can make it easier to find somebody who has an infectious disease and quarantine them make it easier for governments to find and, and isolate uh, a political opponent. Lastly, there are equity concerns that I think um, have not even been fully engaged yet. Um, there has been a, you know, a strong critique of, of technologies like digital contact tracing on equity grounds on the basis that not everybody has access to a smartphone. And so if we're going to move toward the system, some people might get left behind. And uh, that's an important concern because we know that smartphone usage is not universal and it is disproportionately lower among vulnerable groups like the elderly and non-white populations. Um, there are other concerns about burdens on vulnerable communities as well, including the potential for bias in the results of algorithms. Um, on a global perspective, you know, when we think about who participates in the internet and, and cell phone use, um, there are disparities there as well. And that, that means that when we end up with a population data set that's based on those technologies, it's likely to be biased. And as our own Dan Ho and his uh, student uh, Amanda Costin showed recently, cell phone mobility databases do underrepresent the elderly and non-white individuals. So, um, you know, that doesn't mean don't use them. There are statistical techniques to correct for it, but it has to be dealt with. It has to be recognized. And then finally, there are real equity concerns around how the experience of being surveilled um, feels for vulnerable populations. You know, there are some who view contact tracing, things like this, as, as a, a social benefit that the public health system is giving them. It's a form of protection for them. But it's important to keep in mind that for some populations, things like wellness checks carried out by other uh, forms of government, particularly law enforcement, have not been positive experiences, do not bring to mind the notion that government is looking out for their best interests. And as Nicole Martinez Martinez pointed out, um, DCT can start to feel like another extension of a surveillance state that already feels very intrusive and, and not beneficent to these populations. So these, these concerns, of course, have to be taken very seriously. I do think there's, it, it's important to recognize that there are burdens to vulnerable communities associated with not doing some of these things as well. We can't forget that the COVID-19 pandemic, the burden of disease and death falls overwhelmingly on low-income minority communities. And so not to make use of the data that we have in hand has a cost. It has a cost to them. It has a disparate cost to them. And it's important, I think, not to let omission bias, our tendency to prefer risks that come, around, come about because we did nothing to risks that came about because we did something, uh, interfere with reasoned judgment about what is best for the population. It's also the case that other forms of epidemiology also underrepresent these populations because they rely on data from the healthcare system. And who uses the healthcare system, particularly in the United States? It's overwhelmingly people who are better off and white. Uh, so there is already an underrepresented underrepresentation. There's already the potential for bias in data sets. Uh, so there is a potential benefit to this population. And even though everybody doesn't have smartphones, some have suggested one benefit of DCT is that it can allow human contact tracers to focus on those who don't while freeing them up from the responsibility of communicating with people for whom there are just easier ways and, and acceptable ways to communicate. So this equity question, I think, is, is complicated. So these, I think, are the major ethical concerns that we have to be on the lookout for with these types of technologies, particularly digital contact tracing. And I want to suggest a few principles that I think are helpful for guiding us through this thicket. Um, these are not my principles. They're not novel principles. These are kind of bedrock aspects of reasoning in public health ethics and public health law. 
Um, and the first one is when we think about use of these technologies and, and the wisdom of employing them to fight a pandemic like COVID-19, we can't evaluate them in the abstract. We have to evaluate it by reference to what we would be doing instead if we didn't. The counterfactual. And for COVID-19, it pretty quickly became apparent that the counterfactual was failure. Human contact tracers were quickly overwhelmed. We do not have the man, do not, did not, will not have the manpower to keep up with this virus using only human contact tracing. Humans were also perceived by particularly those in minority communities as incredibly intrusive. And so there was a lot of resistance to having people call folks up and ask them who they'd come into contact with. As you can imagine, that's a particular concern for undocumented communities. And because of the characteristics of the virus and asymptomatic transmission, aerosol transmission, it, it simply is not going to work. So what was the alternative? Well, the alternative we got was shut everything down. If we can't find the individuals and can find them, we have to shut everything down. And not all pandemics are going to be that way. You know, some pandemics are awful in their own ways, but not in these ways. Let's think about Ebola, for example. Maybe you've forgotten that in 2014 to 2015, we had an Ebola epidemic raging in West Africa. There were real concerns about its spread to the United States. But if there's anything to like about Ebola, it's that you're only infectious when you're symptomatic and the symptoms are really dramatic. So that's a case where we may not need DCT. But we have to think about whether there is an alternative, moving to the second principle here, that is less burdensome, less burdensome for individuals and will work. And again, that's going to be context dependent. So we're looking for the policy option that is effective at least cost to individual liberty and privacy. And then I think the third and obvious principle that we have to keep in mind as we move forward is with any use of technology, we have to be convinced that there's a reasonable benefit burden trade off. And where the surface is most saliently for me is in thinking about digital contact tracing, now I might be willing to countenance the burdens on, to, on privacy and consent if I felt like it was going to be effective. But if I don't feel like it's going to be effective, then the calculus looks very different. So there's a way in which this sort of militates in a favor of a like, go big or go home. If you're going to do it, you have to do it in a way that produces public health benefit. And that benefit has to be big enough to justify what you're taking away from individuals. So where does all this lead me personally, as I've reflected on DCT? I'm convinced that for many pathogens, um, certainly those with features similar to COVID-19, um, DCT is something we should pursue, that we ought to be thinking about building capacity. I think the arguments that manual contact tracing fails are, are compelling. Um, they've been borne out. You know, this was a theoretical prediction back in the spring that, that was borne out by the fall. And I don't see any way around it. There is just no way to scale up this effort to surmount the inherent challenges around tracking this, this type of a virus. And given the incredible burdens involved in the counterfactual in this pandemic, these massive um, uh, public health orders that, that burden all of us and continue to burden all of us so much, uh, to me, the, the argument in favor of using technology is pretty clear. And the question is just, how do you do it in a responsible way? And that really gets me to my second point is that when we think about this benefit burden trade-off, I think we have taken a bit of a wrong turn in relying on um, extremely privacy protecting approaches, this exposure notification approach, as opposed to systems that integrate directly with the public health system. I think, again, if you're going to involve, if you're going to impose these kinds of burdens on individuals, you want to be convinced that this system is going to be effective, that it can generate actionable information for public health, and it can get that information into the hands of people who can actually do something with it. And I'm not yet convinced that pure exposure notification apps, which are these opt-in apps, and it just tells me who I came into contact with without anything else happening, are going to get us there. Although there are some studies that I think provide you know, some maybe limited reason, reason for optimism. Um, there was a study um, out of Oxford University recently that looked at the UK's exposure notification system rolled out by its National Health Service. Um, it was beset by difficulties. 
Uh, but the ultimate conclusion was that once they fixed those, there was evidence that it substantially limited the size of the winter surge in the UK, which I know is hard to believe because the winter surge was terrible there. Uh, but they, the estimates were that it might have prevented between 200,000 and 900,000 cases that would otherwise have occurred in the US or the UK. Now, 200,000 to 900,000 is a huge confidence interval for a statistical model. And that tells us something about the nature and shakiness of the assumptions that were made in order to reach that conclusion. One of the important things to take away is these systems really only work if there is action taken after the notification, particularly action to help people who don't have an easy time quarantine or isolating. And it's not clear that that happened. It's also not clear that people do, in fact, isolate and quarantine in the numbers that we would need them to. Um, so that's just one of a, sort of a note of pause about the Oxford study. There was also another study in, in Switzerland that recently came out in preprint form, um, just looked at one canton in Zurich, but found that the, the DCT app there triggered quarantine recommendations for 170 people and that one out of every 11 of those notifications led to a positive test result for a contact. So that's a useful piece of information. Again, we don't really know what people did after they got the diagnosis, but if one assumes that people are able to do the right thing and isolate from others, that's a pretty useful piece of information. But there are big gaps, right? One in 11 is not great. Uh, we'd like to have uh, all of these notifications leading to direct useful action. And I think it's possible that pure exposure notification is not gonna get us there. The third recommendation I have really has to do with process. Um, I, I think there's just wide agreement among everybody who's looked at this that we need substantial improvements to the process of developing and implementing these apps. It, sh it shouldn't be led by private companies. It should be led by a partnership, a multi-stakeholder group that includes technologists, but also uh, public officials, health system experts, and ethicists. Um, as well as representation from vulnerable communities. And that uh, if we start from a place of agreeing on our shared goals and values, we might be able to move to a place where we get better technology, more useful technology, and, and more widely accepted technology. And again, this process has not happened in the US even now. And then the final um, recommendation that, that Dr. Wang and I make in the paper, and probably the most controversial one, is that DCT apps be installed on an opt-out basis. So you could have people opt in. That's what Google and Apple did. You know, you got that opportunity on your phone and you could click yes or no. Uh, they could be installed on a mandatory basis. Other countries have done that. But this opt out is a middle ground that essentially notifies people that this thing is going to start tracking them unless they, you know, click, click through and turn it off. And uh, to me, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that that is the least restrictive alternative that will get us where we need to be. Um, and I think it's also helpful in, um, you know, separating out people who really feel strongly about not wanting to be tracked from people who just, for whatever reason, won't take the step to affirmatively install an app on their phone. And just to buttress that point a little bit, what do we know about people's willingness to use these apps? There have been quite a few surveys done over the last year, and they're not super encouraging. Um, some data from last spring where one might say, concern about COVID was at its apogee. You know, people hadn't yet kind of adjusted to life during COVID and were really, really freaked out. Still only about 40% of people in the US um, said they were very likely to install an app like this, another 20 or 30% somewhat likely. And then when we get to July, that's when cases had gone down and people were starting to feel a little more comfortable. It had dropped down to you know, around 40%. So these are not great numbers. Most epidemiologists at this time were projecting we need something around 60, 70% participation in order for these apps to have a big impact. Um, and again, what's likely going on here is, is just this simple human inertia that um, we tend not to take active steps to change the default. And so, a choice architecture intervention that makes this the default and then has people who feel strongly about it move off the default um, might be needed to overcome this, this willingness gap. Finally, I wanted to mention this interesting study that came out relatively recently um, looking at um, uh, uh, data from Washington State. These researchers came out with a fairly provocative finding that even at low levels of uptake, as low as 15%, there would be a discernible effect on COVID transmission associated with these DCT apps. But it's important to note, it's 
pretty small, right? It's still 15% fewer infections, 11% fewer death. And that's if you make massive assumptions, everybody gets tested quickly, everybody immediately self isolates. Um, and there's also a robust manual contact tracing program in place. Uh, it's not until you get up into the very much higher levels of participation that we see really big impacts on, on COVID spread. So uh, overall, I still look at this empirical picture and say, opt-in probably not enough for this. So as I say, this idea that we should have an opt-out system is provocative, it's controversial, a lot of people disagree with me. And I think um, one of the things that makes it especially hard to sort of prevail on this argument is, is this um, just fundamental dilemma about technology, which is that um, in this case, unless everybody installs it uh, on a widespread basis, it's impossible to demonstrate that it's really helpful. But um, until it's demonstrated that it's really helpful, people are unlikely to install it on a widespread basis. So <clears throat> this seems like a classic situation where some form of regulatory intervention coupled with active research and learning to understand whether it works and is worth the trade-off is merited. And that brings me to my final point <clears throat> which has to do with governance. What, you know, what would governance look like if it was done well in this area? And I really like this paper um, in Science by Balsimi and Viena that proposes an adaptive governance model for digital contact tracing. This is a model that's been used in other areas where we're dealing with potentially catastrophic risks and lots of uncertainty, and we're talking about implementing something that is unproven. <clears throat> and it, is, it sort of proposes that governance be decentralized, that the oversight be shared by a variety of stakeholder groups, and that these groups engage in a process of continuous learning to constantly reevaluate decisions to implement and use a particular intervention. So it's a social learning process involving what the authors call reflexive adaptation, the notion that we are going to regularly question our assumptions about design and risk and users' attitudes, and we're going to adopt, um, or rather adapt the technology and potentially de-adopt it um, in response to what we learn. Um, and in this context, they identify four aspects of governance as being particularly important. The first is public engagement. And that means you know, meaningful opportunities for democratic input into the governance of DCT systems. And the opportunities should be regular. So this is not a one and done process. And they should be, again, broadly representative. And there are a variety of ways to do this, from surveys to deliberative forums to uh, oversight groups to notice and comment periods. But the goal here is not just to legitimate what you're imposing on the public, but to actively involve them in shaping the future destiny of the system. The second element is a, a dynamic assessment of the effectiveness of the technology. Again, the notion here is you can't just sort of do this and then say, I did it. It has to be constantly uh, reassessed. Uh, the idea is that you would take your public health goals, whatever you think about as the targets for judging this technology to be effective and look at how it's working on the ground. Um, use the information that you get to tweak strategies, for example, to increase acceptance of the app, uh, to change its design, that you're regularly testing how well privacy preserving features of the app are working. And finally, you're, you're looking at how people are actually behaving in response to information that the technology gives them. Are they actually quarantining? If not, what's holding them back? The third pillar, and salient to our purposes here at the law school, is legal supports. I don't want to talk too much about how privacy law interfaces with all of this, except to say that generally there are public health exceptions in privacy laws that um, give app developers a pretty wide berth here, and public health officials a pretty wide berth to use this information. Um, but because this technology is new and this use of information is new, it may require um, specific legal supports to be adopted. You may need to have legislation passed that sets specific rules for DCT systems. Um, Switzerland did that. They amended their Epidemics Act to, to craft those rules, and there is legislation that's been proposed in our Congress that would do that. Similarly, because a lot of these apps are likely to be deployed by private organizations like employers or colleges, we might want to have some regulatory guidance that shapes how they can use and act on the information. And then finally, the author suggested there's a need for ongoing monitoring of the ethical issues that I've, I've covered today. Um, one issue is how to do informed consent right. We know that, we, we all know as users of the internet that 
online um, authorizations to collect information are seldom read and even uh, less often understood, that we frequently feel we have no uh, meaningful opportunity that, but to accept the terms, and so as a result, we don't even read these. So there are real opportunities to use what we've learned about electronic informed consent to improve things with respect to these apps. And there's certainly a need to constantly reassess public attitudes about the technology and to monitor the experiences of vulnerable populations on the ground. How do they experience being surveilled in this way? What can be done to be responsive to their concerns and to support them better? So this is an ambitious vision. I frankly think it may be too late to achieve it for COVID. Although as we come down off the high peak of the curve and into a pandemic endgame where we're looking at lower levels of disease prevalence, it may uh, we, you know, we may drift into an environment where um, people have enough time and bandwidth and uh, wisdom to begin this process. But I can say one thing for certain, and that is that unfortunately, this will not be our last opportunity to build digital epidemiology into a pandemic response. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for your for your fascinating uh, talk. Uh, and uh, folks are already sharing a number of questions in the chat. So let me perhaps uh, go through them in chronological order. Uh, first question by Juliet. Uh, she was curious to learn a little bit more about some of the references you made, like the Martinez and Martinez uh, paper you mentioned. Is there a way for folks to kind of, uh, you know, read up on, on, on your references, that paper that they could refer to? Yes, I would be more than happy to send the site to that paper if that person wants to email me. I, I would have to dig it out, but I've got it stored somewhere. Oh, okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, and maybe Susan, maybe you could uh, put Michelle's email in the, in the, uh, can we can we share your email? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yep. I'll drop it in the chat. Thanks. And then uh, Alan, uh, Alan's question, I think you sort of uh, uh, answered already. Uh, he, was, he was asking about uh, how DCT has worked in practice, and I think you know when he asked that question, you were just actually uh, giving some some examples of that. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I could say a little bit more about that. Um, I mean, the answer is it varies from place to place. The places where it's been most successful have been places where um, everything is centralized. The government is highly centralized, where the health, there is a national health system that everybody is part of, and therefore there is an easy way to communicate with everybody as their provider, because people trust their healthcare providers um, much more than they trust public health officials or any other government officials. Um, and in places where everybody's kind of on the same technology system, those those places have worked well. Um, and countries like Taiwan and South Korea have demonstrated that, you, you know, if you do this in a transparent way, it is possible to cultivate really high levels of public trust in what what people are doing, even under conditions of emergency where people have lots of reasonable concerns about the exit strategy. In the US, um, we, we have the opposite of all of those things. We have a completely decentralized healthcare system, completely decentralized information technology, uh, and a government that, um, to put it mildly, did not earn the trust of the American public during the pandemic response of 2020. <laughs> so we had nothing going for us other than the very eager participation of lots of, of very capable technology developers. And you know the very predictable result is that the, these apps were not rolled out in in many places. I think about a third of the states implemented it, either you know offered it statewide or some subunit of government offered it. And uptake was really low. And and you know when I talk to app developers, they're they're sort of mystified by why more people don't want to use their product, but. They also haven't taken the time to do any of this public engagement. It just sort of, you know, maybe you had this experience that I had that you woke up one morning and there it was. The offer was on your phone, take it or leave it. Um, and that's just not the way to do things. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting uh, to think about how, you know, different, pro you know, cultures, legal cultures uh, with different feelings about privacy will respond to the, to your recommendation of an opt-out, um, you know, where at the same time, you know, so if you're in Europe, you know, people are generally more concerned about privacy, you should be more concerned about the 
uh, an opt out, but at the same time, there's maybe more trust in in the government overall, and 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 so. I don't know. I, I, have you looked into that, those uh, the kind of regional? Yeah. So there have been one or two studies that have asked the same kinds of questions about willingness to install in different um, Western European and North American countries. And, you know, there, there are differences along the lines of what of what you suggest. And Europe, of course, is not a monolith. There's like the Scandinavians who right. have had nothing but great experiences with uh, with their government in terms of healthcare and social services and have a really long tradition of, go of their governments collecting all kinds of health and biometric data on them and using them to do lots of important things in public health with few or no ill effects. So that's one block. And then there's, you know, kind of there's the French and the Germans and the Italians that have a, a different uh, right. vantage point and, a, and privacy is a much more important and sacred value there, whereas social solidarity, which is so important in the Nordic countries, you know, is not as important in those nations. So th there are these cultural variations, but as you point out, it's, it's not just culture, it's also the government's track record in mm -hmm. cultivating trust among the population. And the final thing to mention, uh, you know, that the Nordic countries have going for them is just homogeneity. You know, we, right. we in the U.S. have to cultivate trust, not in the public, but in many different publics. And, right. um, you know, again, our, our, our recent government was was not good at that. <laughs> not great at uh, promoting homo homogeneity, for sure. Uh, let me, OK, uh, so uh, Geoffrey uh, Wild uh, is a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, he's with um, actually with the Internet of Things at the uh, at the World Economic Forum. He's asking, uh, a new research is emerging for using uh, wearable devices to detect COVID and other infectious uh, disease, diseases in pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic cases, looking at things like changes in body temperature and heart rate. How would legal and ethical consider considerations for this kind of detection for public health surveillance, surveillance differ from DCT? Okay, yeah. So if we think about, you know, how our Apple Watches, for example, could evolve to gather a more comprehensive range of biometric indicators that something might be wrong with us, whether it's COVID or some future illness, um, you know, what, what implications does that raise? Well, you know, one thing that people talk about a lot, not limited to this context, is that um, Apple and app developers, they fall outside most of our health information privacy laws. HIPAA, the federal health information privacy law that governs how our doctors treat our health information doesn't apply to organizations that are not providing healthcare services and are not transmitting electronic information as part of those healthcare services. And so there's this widespread belief that, and which I share and have written about that we need to really rethink our approach to health information privacy regulation. First of all, to understand that in the modern world, the entities that are collecting and, and potentially transferring the most most sensitive information about us, not our doctors anymore. It's it's the people that look at us when we're conducting online activities and, and, and then also through wearables was a sort of extension of that. And secondly, that there are a whole range of bits of information about us that are that are not health information and therefore are not covered by health information privacy laws but our health adjacent information that information that is useful and used to learn something about our health status like what neighborhood we live in or who we came into contact with in that neighborhood and um, we probably should have some rules for how that information is used and combined with other information as well so the wearables issue is is just a little lens into a much broader problem with our data ecosystem which is that we focus fairly obsessively on regulating electronic health records and almost not at all on regulating any other information about human health that's generated outside that context very interesting uh Quinn is saying, thanks for the talk, Michelle. I'm curious for the US willingness survey that you mentioned before, what was the uh, percent of respondents who were strongly opposed to DCT? And wondering, wondering how that impacts the likely level of participation in an opt-out model. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. I mean, it's a minority of people who feel strongly about it. Um, you know, generally, when when you ask people about how use of their information in kind of secondary or unintended ways, 
across a surprising range of contexts from like their clinical trial research data to their everyday health data, it tends to be around 20% who care a lot about those secondary uses. And 80%, they really don't. They don't think about it, it doesn't really matter to them. As long as you tell them that their data are secure from hackers, they don't really mind. So, you know, my sense is it's probably somewhere in that in that range of, you know, maybe maybe it's one in five, one in four, one in six, something like that. And that's a, that actually raises a really hard problem because what do you do when it is a not huge, but not small minority of people who feel very strongly in a way that's opposed to the will of the majority. Mm. It's you a, know, particularly if they're opting out, um, has a substantial impact on our ability to serve the needs of the majority. Right. So it's a, it's a question that has plagued um, all kinds of, of data ethics problems. Mm. Sarah is asking, uh, yeah, it's a head spinning, terrific presentation. Uh, given your uh, comments about the central dilemma and circularity of needing people to sign up for something to assess its effectiveness while balancing autonomy, benefit and burden, et cetera. Do you think there's an ethical path to incentivizing more people to sign up for DCT coupled with stronger regulations and assurances about how their information would be used? Yeah, so the question is what kind of incentives? Um, what I don't love is financial incentives. Mm. Um, you know, for, for I think for reasons that would be self-evident to this group that, um, you know, it can feel coercive to certain populations. It can feel like an ask to sell their personal information. But what about other kinds of incentives? And when we think about a pandemic like COVID-19, what, what would be the single biggest thing we could have offered people that would have gotten them to join in a, a public health scheme like this? You know, how about providing um, whatever social supports they require to, to subsist in quarantine and isolation? You know, whether that's, you know, a check-in, whether it's childcare, whether it is alternative housing, whether it's temporary income support, you know, which starts these things start to verge in financial incentives, but the intent is different. The intent is to support them in doing something that's good for them and it's good for their families and for the public health. Um, and one of the things that, that bothers me about only just paying people to participate in schemes like this is that we don't provide all of these other things. The only thing that we're willing to pay for are things that feel coercive. And you know, the, I have the same reaction to proposals to pay people for vaccination. Um, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather get people to a place where they feel like um, they are a part of a feeling of solidarity because the government, public health, whatever you wanna call it, is there for them and their families when they're being asked to do something hard for public health. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I think that's going back to that public engagement point well, you say, I think if you if you if you educate people to say that if everyone participates, then everyone will enjoy m more freedom. Uh, you know, you'll be able to move around sooner. Then, I mean, that might not be strong enough an incentive. For yeah, that. I mean, the, <laughs> the trouble is that's kind of been the trope that we've been engaging in public health for the last several months, just to get people to put a mask on their face. Right. Just put a mask on your face, right? Because we, that, that's the message, right? We have, if we all do this, we will bend the curve. We will get out of this more quickly. Right. And people, mm -hmm. there are people who, for whom that is just not compelling. It's yeah. just not compelling. And I think one of the reasons that's not compelling is that it is still received as a, you know, a message asking them to make a sacrifice or to submit to a rule as opposed to here's this, you know, Here's this venture that we're engaged in that involves you giving up something, but you're getting some. You and your family are getting something back that that feels immediate and tangible. Um, and particularly, you know, with masks, the, a lot of the messaging was around you do this to protect others. It doesn't really benefit, you know, all this stuff. I, I feel like with DCT, there there's more of a value proposition that we can give to people mm -hmm. a, around the benefit that you know you are getting notified when you have been exposed yeah. and then but the problem is right now as i've said is right now that's all you get you don't get paid time off you don't get child care you don't get alternative housing and so what is it that you're supposed to do with that information that's i think what we can do to sweeten the deal interesting uh that's right yeah so mike's saying uh are there some service 
that show, uh, that show that there is a strong political, ethnic, uh, educational, etc., in the difference in willing to adapt, and that show what encourages, discourages adaption. Maybe they mean adoption of adoption, DCE. Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah, so there are data um, that look at differences in willingness to use these apps by um, age group and by race and ethnicity. And surprisingly, uh, non-whites are actually more willing than whites to install and use DCT um, apps. Let me see if I can just find the data here. I think it was, so this was a survey from May of 2020 found that 72% of Americans overall were willing to share their smartphone data um, if you know certain unspecified privacy protections were in place. 78% um, African Americans and Latinos, 61% whites. So I found that very surprising, maybe suspiciously <laughs> surprising. I'd like to little, know a little bit more about the survey to understand where they got that from. But um, you know that suggests that there is or at least was at that time an understanding in these minority communities that COVID is killing them. And that if there is a technology that can help, they are likely to benefit disproportionately. And that, that's a really important message uh, to get kind of over the last mile to actually having them install the app. So again, I think there has to be a little bit more work to demonstrate that indeed there is a benefit associated with using this. And it's the same kind of issue that we're now facing with uptake of, of COVID vaccines in this population. They, they have the most to gain from vaccination. Here in California, they've been prioritized for vaccination, but there's still a lot of distrust and a long legacy of distrust of government that has to be overcome there. Um, and I think part of, you know, part of the public health outreach to that community has been reinforcing that doing nothing involves disproportionate burdens to them because this pandemic really does burden them. Right, uh, just uh, more praise for you from uh, Thabo, who's uh, saying amazing presentation, Michelle. And, uh, and Steven's asking, also, he's also saying, uh, great presentation, Professor Mello. Can current uh, contact tracing applications factor in the differences in rates of transmission between different COVID strains, or do they use a set of normative assumptions and parameters? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the answer is, is no. Um, uh, they don't, but there really wasn't much of an assumption built in. I mean, the way they work is if you get within a six feet of a phone of a person who has a diagnosis, whatever the strain may be, you're going to get a notification saying you were in contact with the person. And then what you do with that is up to you. Now, you might say, I might do something different if I know it's B117 versus the ordinary strain because my chances of actually having been hurt by that contact are higher. We don't really have any way to effectuate that intention right now. We don't even really do genomic surveillance on those samples that are being tested right now. So if you go in and get a COVID test, unless you're in a very special situation, you're in a like a county that's doing this surveillance, they're not going to look to see what strain you have. So um, that's that's not really part of the game. It's really up to people to say, well, geez, now I know that in California, 20% of the cases are variant. So I'm going to be a little bit more responsive to this notification that I would have been before. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, all right. Well, good. <clears throat> I think, yes, Juliet also likes the idea uh, of, uh, having the public agencies, um, the idea of giving the public agency, sorry, uh, in deciding to give up something in order to get something with DCT, as you, um, as you mentioned before. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's really, um, it's really interesting how this, uh, uh, how this will, will play out going forward, you know, as we hopefully um, are at a point where we, you know, sort of see see the light at the end of the tunnel but as you said you know the next pandemic is only you know a question of time and uh and do you feel like we are prepared now with a lot of research going on around dct and uh and other governance you know uh, uh, approaches uh do you think we'll be better prepared for the next for next next round i th i think that the missing piece right now is any kind of national coordinated effort um 
-hmm. you know, we might be able, you and I might be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I assure you the people who are managing the pandemic response still have their head down and are flat out just dealing mm -hmm. with the fires. So there is, um, they have not gotten to the place where they're thinking about next time yet. Mm -hmm. You know, if you read the Biden pandemic response playbook, it's 200 pages. There's half a page on what we can do to prepare for the next pandemic. And it just says like, we should have a playbook. Um, so I, I think we'll get there. And, and at that point, it's going to be really important for somebody like the National Academy of Medicine to um, to convene people to start really putting this system together. Unfortunately, one of the repeated lessons of infectious disease response in public health is that by and large, as soon as the epidemic ends, everything stops. Mm -hmm everything stops. The money gets ripped out and devoted to other purposes. Working groups move on to other issues. Sometimes labs and surveillance facilities literally get ripped out of the hot zones and dismantled. And, um, and there is not as much learning in the inter-pandemic period as we need there to be. The pandemic period is not the time for learning. It's just not. There's too much else going on. So yeah. I, I, I am waiting to see whether somebody on the national stage will step forward to coordinate that effort once we can all stop worrying about vaccination, community mitigation at schools. Mm -hmm. It's been, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it should be you, I think, as <laughs> someone who is, uh, brings sort of unique insights on the sort of the both uh, the legal policy side and also the medical, uh, uh, the, the public health side. Um, and so, um, so anyways, it was really fascinating to, to, uh, to be introduced uh, to these issues uh, by you. And I feel like um, it's been a really great, uh, great discussion and, conversation with you very much appreciate you finding time in your in your busy uh schedule to speak to our uh, community and yeah a quick uh, sort of round of uh, virtual applause for you very much uh, uh, appreciate you and uh yeah right we i think it's a good uh, point to to close here maybe a little bit early uh but it was wonderful to have you michelle thank thank you so much again thanks very much and thanks again everyone for coming all right Bye -bye. Good. All right. See, see you all.